Welcome to The Cognitive Crucible, produced by the Information Professionals Association. Our website is information-professionals.org, where you can find links and information about today's conversation and get access to members-only content. Join John Bicknell and explore all aspects of our generational challenge, cognitive security. The Cognitive Crucible is a forum that presents different perspectives and emerging thought leadership related to the information environment. The opinions expressed by guests are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of or endorsement by the Information Professionals Association. My guest today on the Cognitive Crucible is Dr. Sean McFate, who is a foreign policy expert, author, and novelist. He is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, a Washington, D.C. think tank, and a professor of strategy at the National Defense University and Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. Additionally, he serves as an advisor to Oxford University's Center for Technology and Global Affairs. Sean Fate, welcome to the Cognitive Crucible. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. The conversation I'd like to have with you today, Sean, will cover your perspectives on modern conflict, especially as you articulated in your book, The New Rules of War, which came out in the 2019 timeframe, I believe. But before we get started, uh, could you give our audience a little bit more background about your career? And also, we'd love to get your overall comment on our current strategic landscape. Sure. So I started my professional life as an officer in the U.S. Army and paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division um, back in the 90s. And my battalion commander was a Lieutenant Colonel Stanley McChrystal and a brigade commander, John Abazid, followed by Colonel David Petraeus. Uh, and and Stan McChrystal has been a bit of a mentor for me. Um, who I'm grateful for. Um, I left the army in 2000, thinking that the future would be nothing but peacekeeping, like in Bosnia, and I didn't really want to do that. And then, of course, you know, life has a way of making other plans for you, and uh, 9-11 happened. I ended up becoming a private military contractor globally, not like the guys who just go to Iraq or Afghanistan. And initially, my clientele was the U.S. government doing things that the CIA or SOF, you know, would traditionally do. And then I branched out and worked for U.S. companies uh, like extractives and so forth. And I saw a different way of war in a different world, a different international relations than the world I sort of was taught in sixth grade. Um, and, uh, you know, I did a lot of stuff in Africa uh, and Eastern Europe and kind of came back away from that thinking, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I want to think deeply about it. So I ended up doing something that I don't recommend anybody do, and that's get a PhD. I ended up going to grad school. And it, and, uh, and, and it was, for me, it was great. Uh, I've been, I'm now a professor at Georgetown University, National Defense University, Syracuse University, where I teach these ideas. I do a lot of writing, both fiction and nonfiction. I find that novels are a great way to tell this world. And my last book, The New Rules of War, um, uh, won a uh, the Economist Book of the Year, has been read widely. It's very controversial. Some people love it. Other people want to tie me to the stake and burn me alive. Um, but it's it's written in a um, an accessible way. I wrote it as like my mother could read it in an airport. It's not written as an academic tome. And I really wrote it for war fighters, um, you know, and for those who are and for strategists who have to think about the 21st century. And, you know, that's the, the key difference of, of our strategic landscape. And my opinion is that the U.S. government, you know, we're still, you know, there's a saying that generals always fight the last war, especially if they want it. That doesn't mean all generals and doesn't mean just generals. So there's a lot of uh, civilians in Capitol Hill who believe this. But I think that's the U.S. is stuck in 20th century politics, 20th century ideas of warfare. And our adversaries are in the 21st century and lapping us. And, you know, they have a boiling of frog strategy of like letting us stew in our ignorance until it's a little too late. And so the reason I wrote the book, The New Rules of War, is to sort of trigger some national discussion about what's the future of war? How do we know? Are we challenging our assumptions? Because I have some rather radical notions compared to, say, mainstream Pentagon. 
So uh, you are an international relations scholar. As another, just a, a, a bit of a level set, um, what is your preferred international relations theory that helps explain how the world works? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I went to graduate school late. I was, you know, 40 years old. Um, and I went with a whole lot of life experience in the thing I was going to study, which people warned me off against. And um, and that's because, you know, sometimes academic theorists are literally living in that ivory tower. Um, and I experienced that. But for me, it was useful. I think if anybody in your audience wants to do it, that it might drive you nuts. <laughs> you just might be chuckling in the back of the room thinking this is the silliest theory in the world. Um, but what I what for me, what happens, I'm I'm what they call a realist. Um, and what that really means is I believe in power politics like Machiavelli. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. The difference between me and traditional IR or political scientist realists is that I am not state centric. So what this means, political science or international relations is very state centric. They view the nation state as the geopolitical unit, the universal and the timeless geopolitical unit of governance throughout human history. And that there's states and there's sub-states like terrorist groups and multinational corporations. And, and then there's super state things like international organizations like the United Nations, which are comprised of states, you know. And they view the world through this lens that the state rules everything and everything's about the state. And I, you know, based on my experiences, especially in wars in Africa, is that states are not drivers of international relations. Sometimes they're booty of war. Like if you look at narco wars in Mexico, you know, states like Guatemala and Salvador are, are prizes to be won between cartels waging war. Yet our perspective in Washington, D.C. is that, no, those are states and they have sub-state actors or, that are drug gangs. And so it's not war, it's criminality. And they wonder why we can't, you know, do much about it, right? So we, we um, too many policymakers, too many academics, they are too state-centric. And if we're learning anything in the 21st century is that, yes, yeah, states are on the world stage still. They're not going to go away, but so are multinational corporations, so are terrorist groups. It's a very crowded stage. And we have to learn how to strategically navigate this much more crowded stage than, say, the 1910, when it was like, seven great powers and that's it um international relations today is a lot more complex and i think the the political science theories about it are a little bit stuck in the 1980s um yeah yeah i i see so you you unpack this nicely in your book uh that uh our state system that we've been living in past three or four hundred years goes back to the the Treaty of Westphalia and that time period. Do you think you could give maybe just a quick 101 on you know how how the 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 state system that you were just describing uh, formed, uh, what the implications have been, and then we can start talking a little bit more about how. Well, I mean, basically, right now you, you assert that that we've been living in an anomalous period relative to human history and nation states. Right. So look, the the world like the world that we learned about in sixth grade in like an American junior high school or social studies that, you know, states have always been around states, you know, there's governments, et cetera. Um, you know, that world is wrong. <laughs> the world, the way the, what we learned was wrong. Um, you know, not states, as we know, the nation state today are only about 400 or less than 400 years old. Their, their, their history, generally people view it as 1648 at the Peace of Westphalia after the 30 Years War in Europe. Now, without getting to the details, because that there's two treaties, and they really don't lay out a system of states, but 
that's the that's what people see as the the intellectual DNA of it. And then over the next like 17th and 18th century, um, states, nation states began to sort of monopolize global governance because before the Thirty Years' War. There wasn't there were sort of states, but they weren't states like the United States of America or Germany or Russia or China. They were empires often like Rome. Ancient Rome was not a state. It was a city with a, an empire that was the Mediterranean. The institutions of a quote Westphalian state that comes after Westphalia, like with institutions and bureaucracy and bureaucrats. That's actually a modern invention. So just because there's political governance, you know, it doesn't mean it's a, na a Westphalian nation state. I mean, tribes are the same way in Afghanistan or the Middle East or Africa. They provide governance. Terrorist organizations like Al-Shabaab and Hezbollah provide governance, but they're not nation states who also provide governance with different norms and institutions. So we were we grew up in this world of like we learned first and only about the nation state. And if you look at the history, that's not what human history is about with a, a powerful nation state that has a monopoly of force within its territory and only it ha can wage wars and only national armies exist. That's our world. But in human history, that wasn't the case at all. You had rich aristocratic families in the Middle Ages waging wars by hiring mercenary armies. The popes used to hire mercenary armies. You had all sorts of things going on, um, you know, cell swords. You know, it's it's sort of it was sort of like you know you you didn't fight for states, you fought for kings and or, or for religion. The Crusades could be thought of yeah. that way. As well. The Crusades were that exactly right. So. This idea that, that international politics is decided by international law and only states, the United Nations, that is, and, and only states are the only political players in the world. That's a very recent notion in human history. It's only about 300 years old. Most of human history, it was what I call durable disorder where it wasn't states in charge. It was like the super rich, the super connected. And it didn't, you know, the world did not collapse into like the dark ages and the Knights of me, you know, it wasn't, uh, <laughs> okay. it, 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 it was a functioning world and it wasn't necessarily any better or any worse. And what I see today and my, my experiences as a private military contractor, some would say mercenary, fighting wars that are not about states in places like Africa, which states never were a strong thing any any time, is that there's a lot of other powers out there. Like multinational corporations are more powerful than many states in the world. Mm -hmm. And now that they can rent their own mercenaries, and their own cyber warriors, and they can do other things, and they're becoming more political. And what I see is like this Westphalian order of a state-centric universe it's unraveling and we're going to the status quo ante of the, you know, before the 30 years war in Europe. Um, and the reason why it's why this notion of states is everywhere is because Europeans exported this political, these political ideals through colonialism and stuff like that. So yeah, we're, I think we're going to, and now we're going to a post Westphalian world order in the 21st century and those of us who grew up in a very strong westphalian background it's hard to see it but if you talk to africans or people in the middle east or afghanistan they're like why is this so hard to see like i don't think of myself as an afghani first i'm a i'm a you know whatever you know i'm a i'm a of this district of this tribe of this language group they don't view themselves as um as you know afghan number one that's like number four or five on their identity list gotcha um first of all i have to circle back and and say congratulations that was the that was the very first monty python reference on the co <laughs> on the cognitive crucible so uh congratulations uh need to be more the uh, knights who say ni. Nee. Um, uh, in, in honor of that, I will find a YouTube video uh, with the knights who say ni. Nee. That is from uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail for those yes. of you who are keeping score at home. Uh, that's number one. Uh, but uh, back back on track. Uh, yeah. So yeah. But back in the age of 
I guess just maybe just pre-enlightenment or the early enlightenment days, uh, there, there were companies founded, uh, what the Hudson oh, yeah. Bay company, the East India company, I think the Virginia company, did I maybe did I get that right? But these, these companies were major players on the world yeah. stage. And it, uh, goes into what you were talking about just a few moments ago. Oh, and, but before you comment on that, I'm, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to analogize the, um, the discovery of the new world by the West uh, as being really similar in a lot of ways to today's um, space race or uh, space exploration. It's like you've got this vast ocean of space and you've got these intrepid pioneers who are venturing out into the void uh, to discover and to, to, to you know, do you know, keep, keep advancing this, this human project. Um, I'm curious, one, do you, do you see the analogy there? And also, could you comment about those uh, companies that were founded in order yeah. to, to do various different things back in the early enlightenment period? So the, um, so there is an analogy between, you know, the space race. And I think once, <laughs> Once wealth can be discovered in space through mining of asteroids, you know, the, the Elon Musk's, the Bezos's, that will become even more so. Because right now, you know, if you ask Elon Musk or NASA why they're doing it, it's a scientific purpose. People are also talking about a plan B in case, you you know, Earth gets wiped out or, you know, we have the human race has a Noah's Ark someplace. Um, so there there is that. And these things take a long time. Um, but there is there is some of that. I, I, in terms of like these, you know, war used to be privatized, right? So one of the implications of states taking over global affairs, the first thing that they did is they out they outlawed private force. They outlawed mercenaries. Uh, they who are literally outlaws. That's the term outlaw comes from it, and they. The stigma against mercenaries, that the origin of that is from just a, a couple hundred years ago when states did this. Like really 1850 is when states outlawed mercenaries and privateers. And, and privateers were like mercenaries of the sea, essentially. Um, you know, and out of work mercenaries become pirates, you know, Johnny Depp and all those people. Um, and so, you know. The um, because you know, if you mercenaries were always private forces, always considered to be how wars were fought. This idea that only a national army could fight a war is a, it's a very modern idea. You know, the Bible talks about mercenaries all the time, the Old Testament, and never with any scorn. The Roman Empire used mercenaries often in the Middle Ages, that's how you fought. Nobody could afford a standing army and standing armies were dangerous for having, you know, palace coups. So they, you know, and, you know, sons of nobility became mercenary captains. They were called not mercenaries in Europe. They're called condottieri. Condottieri in old Italian means contractor, which is what we call them today. And they created these like sort of multinational mercenary corporations that fought in wars in Europe, whether it's the 30 years war or, you know, the Northern Italian, actually, if, if you're, it's just hard to believe it in the middle ages, North Italy was like Afghanistan today, right? It was like, it's hard to imagine today, the world of Milan, but it was. And, um, and so you had like these multinational mercenary corporations and you signed up as a mercenary and you got like, a contract, a condottiere, and they had booty clauses in them, literally booty clauses. Like you get so much percentage of the spoils. One of the things I did for this book, New Rules of War, is I did some hard tour of duty in Northern Italy, in the uh, in Florence and other places, um, in the archives, reading these contracts, and then you know going out for my dolce vita, you know, wine and cheese, of course, as as one does. If in fact, if anybody out there wants to become a a, a, a security studies scholar. Here's my advice. Don't pick a modern war like Yemen or Libya, because you're going to spend your entire career living in Yemen and doing research in Yemen. Pick a historical one that took place in like southern France or northern Italy or some place that you really want to spend a lot of time in for the next 30 years of your life. So, you know, and there's lots to choose from uh, that are nice, like in, you know, you know the Iberian Peninsula, right? 
Um, so I spent a lot of time. Lots of uh, old monasteries and, and, and dusty libraries to, to uh, visit. As, as one has to on their way between, you know, uh, amazing pizzerias and gelat uh, gelato and, you know, all those great things. Um, but the world was very privatized. And, um, and that also included um, what you're talking about, these joint stock uh, ad, you know, adventure companies, because sovereigns alone couldn't afford, you know, kings and queens alone couldn't afford to do these really expensive expeditions. So they created these companies where they had joint stock, where you especially... Uh, well, we're, we're basically middle class, a, a, a small but rising middle class could invest in a stock and they'd give money to like the Hudson Bay Company and you get a certain percentage of whatever spoils they came back with or you lost your money if they disappeared. And the two famous ones was the um, the Dutch East India Company, which started in 1600, and the British East India Company in like 1610 or 1612. And the British East India Company, they they basically, when we had the Boston Tea Party here in the United States in 1775, that's what they, they went onto a Boston East India Company ship, took all the tea and threw it overboard, right, as a protest to the king. The, the British East India Company ruled, settled and ruled India through its own, and it had a, its own military force to rival any great power in Europe. And people often didn't know who ruled whom. Did the crown rule the British East India Company or the British East India Company rule the crown? So you had, you know, privatization has always been a part of military history uh, for good or for bad. Back to your point of uh, durable disorder. That's a, a case, case in point. Um, you know, something that we hear a lot of uh, these days, a uh, new buzz phrase, I suppose, great power competition. Yeah. Um, what do you think about this this phrase and uh, especially the word competition? Yeah, well, nobody likes the word competition. <laughs> we don't know. what. So, I mean, the phrase great power competition or GPC is now the, the nomenclature. Oh, is that of, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah of... of uh, of the Beltway, I, I I live and work in Washington D.C. Uh, if you really work in national security, you got to be close to the flagpole, as many of your listeners know, um, which you know has a warping effect on people's minds often. Um, but great power. So in 2018, the U.S. Department of Defense reoriented its strategic posture in the 2018 National Defense Strategy. It went from focusing on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency of, of, you know, what we used to call the global war on terrorism to great power competition, which really means China and Russia. We're going to focus, you know, so it's, it's now it's like China, number one, Russia, number two, maybe, you know, Iran, North Korea, and then five would be terrorists. And so terrorists are still in the top five, but rather than being number one, they're number five. You know, of course, Lockheed Martin is ecstatic about this because they can build more, you know, airplanes and ships. And that's what people think we need, which we don't. We can talk about that in a bit. Um, but great power competition, you know, they, they we don't have a good word for war. And the reason we don't is because of our norms of conventional war, of World War II style war, the laws of armed conflict. We view you know, laws of armed conflict, conventional war, it views war like pregnancy. You either are or you're not, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or it views it like a light switch. It's either on or it's off. And, you know, and what happens is, of course, that is complete nonsense. There's no, war is not black or white. It's not on or off. It's not, you know, it's not war or peace. It's war and peace, War, it's a blend. It's never, you know, and that's kind of what the new rules it was one of the rules of the 10 new rules of war. Number three, I think, is it's not war or peace, it's war and peace. It's not, it's it, just think about it as conflict. And, you know, many powers like Russia and China, this is, they're very comfortable in this. If you read Sun Tzu, which is the art of war, there's no war or peace. You know, Klaus has war or peace. 
But to Sun Tzu, it's always you're in that blend. You're always doing something and you're always defending against something. And you got to think that way. And that's how our Cold Warriors used to think. The Cold War was not a metaphor to them. It was a hot war. It just was it looked different than World War II. And then curiously, in the last 30 years, we've forgotten how to, to do that. We've like, oh, okay, it's either war, it's peace. And our adversaries exploit this. They get right in between that space of war or peace and they exploit it for victory. So an example of this is, you know, like, look, we, um, we've been throwing carrier group after carrier group in the South China Sea for the last 10 years. Thinking like conventional war theorists, think World War II, that's deterrence. But it's not deterring China. They keep on expanding in the South China Sea. And they're doing it with no carrier groups, at least not until very recently, perhaps. And the, this is this is their strategy of how they're doing it. They they play a game of chicken with us, with you know, what they call fawn ops, freedom of navigation operations. They go right up to they they they'll they'll do like fighter planes you know, over islands that they want to, you know, they want to take, they go right up until we might flip that war switch to on and take them all out. But they stop just short of that, like a game of chicken, but they keep everything they collect and done over a decade. This is why they're winning the South China Sea. And they're also by extension winning allies and they're winning at least they're, you know, they're, they're trying to show Asia that and like the Philippines, Vietnam, that they're the big daddy in town that we're not because they can poke their finger in our eyes and we don't respond much. So that's an example of how our paradigm of war or peace is getting in the way of our strategic national interests. I'd like to circle back, if I may, Sean. I, I, I know we've already talked about uh, the the Westphalian system and some of the implications there, but I'm curious to get your take on, you know, big concepts like like sovereignty and citizenship, and so we, we have like really big companies these days, which can potentially be analogized to like the East India company. I mean, they're huge, like Amazon, for example, or or Google or Alphabet, whatever you want to call them, maybe Facebook or Meta. I'm curious, do you foresee some kind of a future where people could relinquish their geographic citizenship so I'm a U.S. citizen. I mean, one day, could I be like a citizen of, of Amazon if I really liked what Amazon's philosophy was and the direction that they're going and that kind of thing? I, what, I mean, there's you're, you're describing like a, a blurring of the lines between sovereignty and and nation states. And I mean, what what are your thoughts on all that? Yeah, it's a great question because. On one hand, I'm talking about how most nation states in the world are retreating, you know, and yet we're also talking about China and, you know, as a huge nation state. And, you know, there's about 190 to 195 nation states in the world, depending on who you're counting. The vast majority of them are weak, failing or failed. When people think of nation states, they usually only think of the top 25, like in North America, in Western Europe and Eastern Asia, you know, some parts in between. But most of them are like, you know, they think of ones in Africa or in, you know, parts of Latin America, like Venezuela or uh, Middle East or Afghanistan. They're they're not really strong or they're just like regimes inside of a state, really, more than anything else. And I think so you're seeing, a, you know, there there's a contraction there. You're seeing the the rise of some big autocracies like um, you know China, Russia are rising. Iran wants to rise, um, but you also are seeing the rise of non-state actors too. And I don't mean like Al Qaeda. Like yes, they're out there. Everybody knows all about that. I'm talking about multinational corporations and super rich people. Um, you know, one of the jobs I did when I was in the private military world is I also worked in the private intelligence world, like private CIAs. The private military world and the private intelligence world at the top, at their like sort of tier one level, they merge to a large degree. And guess who a lot of their clients are? They're like extractive industry. They're, I work for Houston oil catters. And if you go to places like Houston, Houston has a totally different geography of view of the world. They are an energy capital of the world. And they don't view Washington, D.C. or Beijing as really that important. They look at 
you know, you know, uh, to them, it's like Houston, the golf, the golfies, other, that's where the hubs of power for them lie. And they engage and they do their own sort of national security and foreign policy. And they engage in their own cyber warfare, their own spy stuff, their own mi private military stuff when they need it. They, they engage more and more like states and they, they have compounds in, where their people live and they take care of those compounds and they provide rule of law and government. So like what I'm saying is like this world of states, a lot of those functions are being, you know, increasingly multinationals, especially extractive industries. I mean, oil, gas, and you know, you know, mining, because they have to go where the asset is. And they're always in dangerous, hard places. Uh, if you're an oil company, you got to go to, let's say, Somalia. And you got to invest there for 20 years. So you got to be political. And they are political. The idea that when ExxonMobil shows up to the Gulf of Guinea in Africa, it's just somehow a sub-state actor and that Gabon is somehow more powerful because they are a state and ExxonMobil is not. Of course not. And does ExxonMobil do shaping operations there? Well, I'm not going to say officially, but it's possible. Hypothetically, they can do all sorts of things. And that's how CEOs think. They think a lot like um, you know, a statesman does. And and it's not just that it's like you talk about information like Facebook and or what Alphabet, whatever it's called, Meta, or they also have a lot of power and they have a lot of power in domestic politics for big countries, too. And so they can wield it. What happens if Elon Musk, you know, you know, now that you can rent MI-24 Hind helicopters, which are big attack helicopters on the free market, you can rent Russian special operations forces to do whatever you want to do. Suddenly, you know, ExxonMobil can have its own military. Elon Musk can have its own mil his own special operations forces. Um, oligarchs already do this. Can a mega church do this in the future? You know, just think of if there's an ISIS 2.0 and they start to crucify Christian men and rape and sell Christian women and girls uh, as they did in 2015. If that started again, there are some big mega churches with like $90 million budgets who could easily, you know, who don't have any faith in the UN to do anything or the US government that is going to dither, who might want to save Christian lives. They might hire a mercenary company to go into enclaves of Christian enclaves in Syria, if any are left, and create like protection zones and keep out, you know, the ISIS fighters. Or how about this? They issue a bounty on all ISIS heads and let the let the Boba Fett's of the world go after them. So world, you know, warfare and international politics with it is becoming increasingly more privatized. You know, and meanwhile, we have a bureaucracy, we have like, you know, a Pentagon who can, a State Department can only think in terms of state on state engagement. And, and they can only think in terms of like Klaus Witzian steel on steel warfare. And they look at everything else as a lesser than or a sub uh, lesser than task. And we wonder why, to be blunt with you, we haven't won a big war since 1945, right? We Our strategic thinking has been moribund. It's been like mired in the mud. Meanwhile, adversaries like Russia have become a disinformation superpower. China has become a three, you know, there are three warfare strategies about how to win the information fight, which is now eclipsing the physical fight. And, you know, I, you know, multinationals can do it too. So I think we're the 21st century shaping up to be an international relations environment, which is quite different than the 20th century. And we are still thinking, we in the US in the strategic circles are still thinking largely like it's somewhere in the late 20th century. You started talking about this just a moment ago, but I wanted to ask you, you know, so how does information operations, uh, uh, strategic messaging, strategic communications fit into what we've been experiencing over the last, say, five years for sure, maybe a little bit longer, uh, but also going forward? Yeah, I mean, first of all, your your listeners know a great deal more than your average Joe or Jane, right? <laughs> and we all know that the U.S. government 
between the the tangle of like pre-internet age authorities and laws, the Smith Monk Act and all these constraints and also all the bureaucratic culture about who should own this, the State Department, the IC, the DOD, and you know, and, and how do we do this in the absence of a grand strategy? I mean, every it's a complete Gordian knot. It's a complete heaping steaming mess, right? So I'm not going to be, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and say, well, I, you know, you know, here's a solution to that. Because the only solution to that is going to either be a functioning Congress, which is probably not going to happen anytime soon to do a, like a Goldwater Nichols Act or something like that to, 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 to make this work. Right. Um, and, or like we, well, that, that's probably, you know, what it's required to take to do that is very difficult. Um, we all know the, the constraints. Now let's talk about, I wanna talk about instead how the character of warfare is changing and what we need to do. And some of it is not surprising to your listeners, but some of it is. So look, warfare is changing and it's changing because, you know, from like conventional war, think of World War II, think of the strategic logic of Clausewitz, think of battlefield victory. Those are, you know, that's what it, you know, the 20th century was about. For winning wars, it was all like, you had a big, you know, if states had political differences, they couldn't resolve, they would go to war. The primary instrument was the military. War is the failure of peace. You declare war, you go to war, you, you achieve battlefield victory, whether it's Stalingrad or Berlin or Midway, that changes the course of the of the war. Somebody finally signs a declaration of, you know, whatever, we lose. They have the USS Missouri moment, and then we go back to peace. That's conventional war thinking. That's how we're set up to be. War does not work that way anymore, all right? When we, we all remember 2003, Mission Accomplished, Right with President George W. Bush and aircraft carrier, two thumbs up, mission accomplished. We achieved perfect, perfect battlefield victory over the Iraq military forces. It was inconsequential strategically for that war. You know, um, what matters more today than bullets downrange is information. Right? No, you know, obviously, organized violence will never go away, but how it's used is going to change. But what matters a lot more today is information. And why is that? Is because we live in an information age. We have the past 30 years, we will for the next 30 years. In an information age, the center of gravity is information. Now, tactically and operationally, what does that mean? That means you, if you wanna win wars, you do it with maximum plausible deniability. Right. You don't what you don't do is, is you don't do what Putin tried to do this past February and wage conventional war. You don't go out in the open on a blitzkrieg into another country with tanks because conventional war doesn't work anymore. We've seen plenty of examples of that. The last conventional wars before this year was the 1980s, like the Iran Iraq war, the Falklands, you know, Gulf War One. Nobody, you know, and, and if you look at all the conventional wars since World War II, it's only like 10, maybe 15. And most of those were before 1975. You know, the if you look at a chart of conventional wars versus unconventional, conventional wars are like flatlined in the bottom to almost zero. Convention, unconventional wars are everything else. They're going up and up and up for the last 70 years. Yet we still maintain lots of money to maintain a conventional force on the theory that it gives us deterrence, even though we know it doesn't in South China Sea. And it didn't our, it didn't deter Russia from going into Ukraine. So what we need is more information. So plausible deniability is how you win. Look at what you how Russia took the Crimea in 2014, what they did, the means and ways that they employed all gave them plausible deniability. They didn't blitzkrieg in. They used things that like Spetsnaz special forces, mercenaries like the Wagner Group, little green men, these mm -hmm. astroturfed fake Russian separatist militias in the East, and loads of active measures and propaganda. Right. And and Putin just 
lied uh, right. all the all lied. the way up, all, all, all the way all the it. way all the way up until you know it was a done deal. That's right, and so that's exactly what he did. So if you want to get away with war these days, you you create the fog of war through disinformation, tactically and operationally. You use covert means and ways to slither through that fog of war. And then when the West is still scratching its head about what were the facts on the ground in eastern Ukraine, the Crimea was a done deal. And only then did, did Putin say it was us all along. And only then did conventional war weapons like tanks and, sh and frigates show up. That's how you do it. I mean, look at the wars in Libya. That's been under a fog of war since 2011, right? Do we know who's still there and fighting and why? No, we don't. We do not know. And it's multinational. We've had in the past Russians, Turks. We've had, you know, Gulfies. We've had insurgents, you know, organized crime. We've had, you know, Tatal oil companies sniffing around the edges. Um, you know, it's under a complete fog of war. And so occasionally it will, it violence will spike and, it, you know, and, you know, global media attention focuses on it. And then all the sort of actors then go into the shadows as quickly as possible beneath the threshold of international media, right? Because I don't, nobody wants that for different reasons. And so war is about maintaining plausible deniability. So how do you fight that tactically and operational? Well, we need, one thing we do is we have to create implausible deniability on the ground. So you use our intelligence community, using our assets to create implausible deniability and pre-bunking, like a sort of what we did in the lead up to February of this year. Like, you know, if we know Russia is going to do some ruse, like, oh, this is our pretext. If you can reveal it, it's like a sort of an information spoiling attack, right? Yeah, I think that that's actually well founded in um, cognitive principles. Like it's the whole saying, you know, the... Uh, uh, a, a lie, you know, gets out and goes around the world before the truth even has an opportunity to put its shoe its shoes on, right? But if you can get out in front of that, uh, then that that can have like a a, a defusing effect. That's right, and and uh, it certainly it it creates questions that no matter what Russia does, it's a sort of a spoiling. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a cognitive spoiling attack, right? Um, so another thing that we could do is besides implausible deniability, look, you know, this is a little bit more underhanded, is if Putin says, hey, those Wagner Group mercenaries are not really there, and we know that they are, well, then who will miss them if they disappear by morning? You know, so we can use it against them. So, um, and there's also how do we compete? Now, the bigger question is, how do we do this at the strategic level? And um, we know that, you know, here's an example of cognitive. So we know that our, so for, so for example, our enemies are trying to do this to us. Rather, they know they can't conquer the U.S. conventional war style. They're way ahead of us. So, but they know that what they're trying to do is that in information age, it's the idea is that you don't conquer a country from without going you know, blitzkrieging within is you reach into a country using illicit information techniques and disinformation to find existing, you know, scabs within a society, historical wounds. You rip them apart and you pour jet fuel on them and light them on fire all, you know, covertly. So we have a red and blue culture war going on in our country. Our adversaries are definitely trying to stir that pot. And the idea is not that we go away like, you know, Berlin in 1945. The idea is that we tear our own throats out so that we deflate and become a first world power without any influence. We become like the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom 100 years ago was a superpower. Now it's like Austria, right? That's what that's what China wants out of the U.S., you know, they want us to be to deflate in terms of power. And they're doing things using, the, you know, their three warfare strategy to manipulate this. Russia has things like the troll factory or the troll farm. Others are doing it too. And so are private sector actors. So we need to, you know, rather than spending $13 billion on a new aircraft carrier that probably, you know, if there's ever a shooting war, it'll be the bottom of the ocean in 20 minutes, you know. Let's take that $13 million and think about technologies to defend against 
deliberate deliberate inform you know information manipulation of the like a malign influence of the American people. And that's really hard as a democracy because we can't engage in censorship, you know, but can there are some things that we can do to help Americans make better choices about what information they consume. Right. And we've got an open society, right? We have mm -hmm. uh, in, enjoyed uh, the uh, sanctuary uh, that the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans have afforded us for a very long time. But now with the internet and all of its, you know, amazing uh, 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 connectivity that it's that it's enabled for us, uh, but it's simultaneously been uh, basically collapsed those geographies. And now uh, information rounds are coming in uh, more or less unimpeded. And on top of that, uh, American companies uh, through their business models uh, allow it uh, un un under you know uh, traditional business practices. So uh, the adversaries of the West in general, it's not just a U.S. problem, but have uh, weaponized the status quo system against us. What are your comments on that? Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. So look, I mean, your earlier question about corporate citizens. I mean, Facebook. Some employees have told me there's they used to have this chant company before country, company before country. Good luck finding a patriotic CEO. Look at all the tax havens, multinational setups that don't have to pay taxes. These are not good citizens, right? I'm so many corporate corporations, their corporate mailing address is a PO box in Ireland somewhere. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and so, you know, this idea, it's you know, these companies, they you know, you talk about corporate citizenship. Yes, we're going to all hold our passports and some may hold many passports, but your true loyalty, your allegiance may not be to that country first. It'll be to that country second. It's to Apple. It's to whomever. And we see this in multinational corporations already. And um, and they, you live a life, it's like being in the military. You live a life abroad, you know, and um, you come to do tours in the headquarters, but you you generally don't stay there. Um, and you're really interested, your your incentive structure, or, you know, a quarterly profit share thing. You're, you know, so I'm not saying everybody in these companies is, is sort of a mercenary, but I'm saying like, that is how, the, the C-suite, the, the COO, the CEO, the CFO, that's how they're wired to think. And they're internationalist in their perspective. And if you want to become a senior decision maker, that's the perspective you adopt young, just like any other large organization, right? Um, and that's how the business world looks at it. And the, the business world generally scorns the government communities of, of, you know, that's what you do if you have no life skills, you join the army, you you know, and it's really demeaning. And that's not true. I mean, I, I, you know, I think people, I mean, they're, you know, it's not true. And if you look at their, you know, look at their spectacular successes, like 2008, I mean, come on, right. So I'm being sarcastic there, right, but yeah. um, uh, I'm, I'm just sort of tossing a holy hand grenade into that work up on my money Python uh, quote. Uh, uh, another one. The holy hand grenade of Antioch. Doing my, I'm gonna do my best to work in the last couple of minutes. Um, uh, but but look, I mean, here's the problem: you you can't. We are an open society, and we all know that. Let me let me say this: is that the new rules of war? I, this is the question I try to answer: is that look, war is changing, warfare is getting more sneaky. It's, became, it's getting more sneaky because we live in an information age and manipulating information, being sneaky, being Sun Tzuian is changing warfare away from a Klaus Witzian paradigm to a Sun Tzuian one. Klaus Witz is all about physical utility of force. Sun Tzu is all about strategic deception. Those two guys do not agree on much. And of course, we only generally teach one of those guys in war colleges, and that's Klaus Witz, <laughs> even though war today is all about Sun Tzu. So the, the book suggests these 10 new rules or idea about how you, this is actually how modern warfare has changed. It's about information. We've got to, you know, if you really want to get China out of the South China Sea, you really want to get Russia out of Ukraine, this conventional war stuff of deterrence, it's not working. 
And if there's ever a conventional war, it'll probably go nuclear within a few days. All these like war games in town in DC of these artificially elongated conventional war phases in the streets of Taiwan is total nonsense. It's total, you know, confirmation bias. So like, here's what we need to do. We might need to consider if we if we really can't keep these other countries out of us because we're an open society and we're proud of it and we don't want to become a, a, a democratic autocracy. We don't want to become Orwellian. You know, so what do we need to do? Well, maybe we have to engage in some sneaky deterrence. Hit them, you know, you need to impose costs. So like I gave an example earlier of like, Putin says those little green men aren't there. Well, who will miss them if they disappear? You know, are there things that we can do in the information? So can we create narratives? Like, look, you know, Shanghai, the, the zero COVID policy that China has of like locking down all of Shanghai for like, what, I don't know how many days. It was, could we not turn that into a color revolution, Right. Are there things that we can do to pro using information and other things, some of it overt, some of it clandestine, to create problems within these autocracies so that they get more concerned about their regime security than expeditionary warfare? And they voluntarily pull out of the South China Sea. They voluntarily leave Ukraine. They voluntarily leave us alone. Because, you know, like, for example, here's a, an example that some of your listeners, some of them will either be aghast, others will like take this and run with it. Let's use their regime type against them. I mean, goodness knows they're using democracy and our regime type against us, you know, by trying to hack our elections, by trying to manipulate the red versus blue divide. Let's do the same to them. But let's do it, you know, let's tailor it to autocracies. So autocracy is the way they work, as you know, they concentrate all of their power at the top of a pyramid. It centralized all their power. It's really the name of pyramid. It's more of like, like a telephone pole, right? And you have an autocrat up there with his lieutenants and they make all the decisions, Xi Jinping, Putin, whomever. And, but they're all very nervous about their life expectancy because they're all really scared about a palace coup. Now, is there a way that we can use our own information, dark arts, to con to somehow covertly convince them that there will be a palace coup in the next whatever, and they take out their lieutenants for us, right? Can we be devious too? Yes, we can. Should we be is a bigger question, right? But here's another, because we all know from like the church committee of the 1975, 76, that secrets of democracy are not compatible. But if we're seeing war get sneakier and conventional tactics and strategies are failing us and these other ways are working, I think we have to consider making an American version of that somehow. We need to become more adept, especially strategically, about how we deploy weaponized information. <clears throat> and those there'll be some people out there say, well, that's dishonorable. And my, I have two responses. You know, first of all, norms in war change. In 1914, all the generals of Europe would say using a machine gun was dishonorable. Using a submarine or an airplane with guns on it to kill people is dishonorable. By 1918, that was the norm. Things evolve, they change. The second question is, you know, is it is it really somehow better to lose honorably or then to win dishonorably? If you had to choose, what would you choose? Because I think we have too many normative cooks in the kitchen in places like Capitol Hill and others who are telling us, like, you know, homily, like we cannot do these things. But they have no skin in the game, right? They're not, you know, or they don't see what's going on. So I, what I advocate strongly in the book, The New Rules of War, is we need to become more savvy. We should consider, reconsider the dark arts. We need to weaponize information. How we do it, I do not know. But that needs to be the national conversation around national security and not like how many F-35s to buy. Right. 
That's thought provoking stuff uh, for sure. And I'm reminded of like one of my favorite quotes from an American general. Uh, you and you mentioned this fellow in your book, um, uh, former Army Chief of Staff Eric Shinseki. But w w the quote from him that I love, I think is relevant here, is something like, um, if you dislike change, you're going to dislike irrelevance even more. Yeah, um, exactly. And I think I think we can take a page from that uh, for sure. Um, yeah. How about we do a quick lightning round and then close out, Sean? Yep. Um, All right. Lightning round, so 30 seconds or less, that kind of thing. Um, whole of government or whole of society effort? Um, good buzzword. It doesn't work in reality, especially in a heterogeneous, large democratic society like our own. Hearts and minds. Um, does not work in the tactical and operational level as we tried to do in Iraq or Afghanistan. But at the supreme level, at the strategic level, it is supreme. So, for example, look at China and what they're doing with Hollywood. All volunteer force. We need to keep it. However, how, we have less than 1% of our country that serves in uniform, and this creates moral hazard in foreign policy making. Because it's very easy to say, let's, let's go to war if you have no skin in the game. And uh, and it, it overburdens the one percent of our population, and and it, and the others are like, you know. So I think all the all volunteer force has many pluses, but one of the minuses is that we have a a much more anemic discourse on foreign policy, a lot more America rather than a let's actually have a conversation. Do we want to do X, Y, and Z? Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, personally, I'm 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 torn on that one myself. I I think a um a schedule of national service with, with other options besides the military yeah. could, could, could be a good thing. Uh, the uh, Peace Corps, uh, AmeriCorps, stuff like that. I think so. And, and Stan McChrystal pushes this. So one of his big thing. Yeah. So you do like two years in the army or three years doing a civil something or one and two, some, some combination. I mean, something like that, but yeah. You um um you know you, you could drive an ambulance, be a social worker, you can do firefighting, you can you know be in the military. Oh yeah, and I think there's a lot of merit to that. I don't see it as being politically viable, but I think it it would, for a lot of reasons, would do some good to a, especially a, a fracturing country. Last lightning round question: strategic atrophy. Yeah, that's what's afflicting the Washington D.C. strategic classes right now. They're stuck in uh, 1945 glory days rather than thinking hard about the the how we you know do well against autocracy or China or whatever. So we 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 are suffering strategic atrophy right now. Uh, last couple of questions, real quick. We have a lot of students and researchers who listen to this podcast. Sean, could you offer a few a fruitful research question that's related to the kinds of things we've been discussing? Um, sure. <clears throat> How can democracies fight secretive wars to not lose a dem democratic soul? Would be one. Um, how do you, ch you know, there's a saying by management expert, Peter Drucker, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. What that means in national security is that our strategic culture can often eclipse our strategic IQ. And I think that's what's going on today. So how do you break the strong strategic culture of, say, the Department of Defense, which is all about conventional war and not about, like, and it, it views information and these other things as either not their problem or a lesser than task. So how do you change that? Also, how do you create good strategic thinkers? What is strategic thinking? How do you create it? Because the war college system is not really working and civilian universities don't do it. They say they do, but they do not. They, you know, you take like a, a strat if you go to security studies graduate school and you take a strategy class, it's all political, it's all political science theory, like realism versus neoliberalism. That's not strategy. It's something else. So I think the strategic studies community is also more abundant. So how do we resuscitate that with quality? And, you know, and I have some ideas and all those things, but um, there was some, those are, we need help with those topics. All right. Excellent suggestions. And other than your book, The New Rules of War, we'll have a link in the show notes, obviously. What's another book that you could suggest for our audience? Yeah, it's a good question. So I would recommend people read 
1999 book called Unrestricted Warfare. It's by these two Chinese colonels. And their question is, okay, we can never beat the United States in a, in a military, military fight, but we can still beat them. How can we do it? Unrestricted Warfare, which you can find as a PDF online and download, has some great ideas. And, you know, we might start to look at that too. Um, so I recommend um, Unrestricted Warfare. And I also uh, a second book would be A Good Translation of Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Avoid, um, so I think Cl Th Thomas Cleary is a very good one. Um, and there's some others, but avoid the Griffith one, which is what they always assign in the U.S. Department of Defense. It's so-so. And do not do the uh, free one by Lionel Giles. It's like this 1909, you know, you know, it's not copyrighted. So people, it's, it's unreadable. But I think war is becoming more Sun Tzu. Uh, Thomas Cleary's foreword to the art of war in his translation is 50 pages and really lays it out very, very articulately. So those are the two books I would recommend reading. All right. Some outstanding suggestions and uh, very uh, provocative ideas. Sean McFate, thank you so much for being a guest on The Cognitive Crucible. Well, thanks. Uh, it's always a pleasure. And I'm a big supporter of the importance of information. The Cognitive Crucible is the only podcast dedicated to increasing interdisciplinary collaboration between information operations practitioners, scholars, and policymakers. To find out more about the Information Professionals Association, visit us at information-professionals.org. Please support our podcast by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review.